Welcome to Military Faith and Spiritual Resilience. This is Elizabeth Fulgaro. With me today is Erin Nichols, nutrition and fitness coach and Gold Star wife. Hi, Erin. Hi, Elizabeth. So you were talking about how Sam and you had met and became Sam and Erin. Mm -hmm. And you were still in high school. You had started community college. So how did... And you were in the Air Force ROTC. Mm -hmm. How did Sam end up in the Marines? Sam was, like, born in the wrong century. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> he, had, he had kind of this inner warrior about him. He loved ancient China and Japan, the, like, samurai tradition, Vikings. Uh, his grandparents were Norwegian, and his dad had... Uh, tried to join the Marine Corps. He, he went to boot camp and ended up medically discharged during uh, during boot camp with an injury. But it had just kind of always been with him. He was always really into the Marines. He wasn't, he wasn't like chest beatingly patriotic, but he had this sense of like duty. Sure. Still. So it just given, given the, the our time, the Marine Corps for him was it. If it was a different time, he would have been a knight or a samurai or a ninja or totally makes sense. Whatever. Now, what year are we now? It's it. Where where are we? So that was two thousand three. So at that point, I had moved in to his parents' house. I lived in his his oldest brother had moved out a couple years before. So I had my own room, and I was working part time at Carmax and going to school. Uh, at the community college, Sam was working at Albertsons, our local grocery store, part time, and then also he did a year uh, at, at community college as well, uh, the same community college. And so one day I came home from work, and I get the, "Can you come here? I need to talk." And it's like, uh oh, like heart sinks. And so I sit down on the end of the bed, and he tells me that he thinks he wants to join the military. Probably the Marine Corps, but he'll go to all the recruiters and see what's up. And so this was like March or April of 2003. So for context, we defeated the Iraqi Republican Guard in May of 2003. So this is, you know, right at the kind of at the beginning of uh, Iraq, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And... Um, you know, at that point, we also thought that this was going to be much more like a desert storm, desert shield kind of thing as far as the time frame goes. And I come from a military family. I come from an Air Force family. I was born on an Air Force base, um, uh, off at Air Force Base in Nebraska. My dad got out actually right like when I was born. He grew up as an Air Force brat himself, lived all over the world, went to a Spanish-speaking kindergarten in Spain not speaking Spanish. And my grandpa's last duty station was Beale Air Force Base in, in Northern California, and that's how they ended up um, where they did. And so, and I have an, uh, an aunt who was married to a pilot in the Air Force, and when I was a kid, got to go and stay with them, and I just, I loved being on base. My cousin and I were like 12, and my aunt was like, we're out of honey, girls go up to the store and get us a bear of honey. And we just hopped on bikes and went over and did it. And I thought, wow, that is so cool that we can just do that. And um, there's no way in our neighborhood with like big streets and everything, it wasn't that far away. The, the closest grocery store is only a mile and a half, two miles away, but my mom wouldn't have let me do that, you know, at home. And so the idea of living on a military base and like having having an income, having insurance, having um, a place to live, it, it, like it solved a lot of problems for us as these young adults who were kind of too big for our britches in a, in a lot of ways. Um, we just didn't know what we wanted yet, and kind of the thing that was stopping us from getting married because we were only you know, 18 and 19, but people are, you know, like, when are you guys going to get married? Because we'd been, other than that time that we had been broken up, like five months or so, we'd been together for almost four years already. 
And so the, you know, we weren't getting married because the only thing that would change if we got married is that we would be able to share a room. And, but we would still be living with his, at his parents' house. We would still be working part-time and going to school. And so this kind of solved that, like, how do we start our adult lives problem. Um, and then again, we didn't think that the war in Iraq was going to be what it turned out to be. So, you know, he went to the, he went to the recruiting stations and um, kind of as we expected, he settled on the Marine Corps. And because we'd been on ROTC, we had relationships with the recruiters as well. So great, great Marine name. Sergeant Hercules was his recruiter. That's a great name. <laughs> that is a great name. Um, and um, started the process. And because the Marine Corps is so small, it takes several months between the time that you join what's called the delayed entry program and you actually leave for boot camp. So, you know, that was like March or April. And then he went to boot camp, I think October 13th. So as we're having this conversation in the bedroom, I'm I'm almost kind of relieved that like, okay, we have like a plan. And then I think it was me that said like, all right, we should get married then before then. That way like the paperwork's done and it'll make the transition easier. So super efficient. Yes. And efficient, yeah, it makes sense. The recruiters didn't love it because it was more work for them, but um, that's what we did. So we, we both worked at a country club. I was still working at, no, I was working at CarMax at that point, but I had, I had worked at a country club for like a year and a half. Sam worked there for a little while. His brother did as well. And We'd seen all these fancy weddings. He had, they had a bunch of adult cousins that were between like five and 10 years older than him. And so it was like at least once a year, there was a big Nichols family wedding. And as special as every bride is, really when you think about it, like all weddings just kind of run together. And it's just a big extravagant thing. And to, to us, it just, the wedding itself wasn't important. Um, didn't want to spend a lot of money, just not into the, all the pomp and circumstance. And so we just wanted it to be casual and fun. And so, in fact, our wedding invitation was a flyer that said, it's a wedding. Um, and we just had it at Folsom Lake at Granite Point. There's a activity center there that you can rent. So like a bathroom and a kitchen and um, air conditioning uh, because it was end of July oh, that we ended up having the, the, our <laughs> wedding. Yeah. And the ceremony was outside. So we were mostly in the shade, at least the, you know, our guests were in the shade, the wedding party during the ceremony, we were, we were mostly in the sun and dripping sweat. Um, but yeah, so we just ended up doing it outside. Um, it was kind of like Island theme, Hawaiian themed. And when you look at the pictures, because you can see the water and then the foothills, behind us uh, during the ceremony, it, it, it kind of passes. People think we got, if they just see the pictures, they think, oh, wow, you got married in Hawaii. It sounds like you made it fun for yourself and your guests. Yeah, we, that, and that's exactly what we wanted. We, we wanted it to be a wedding that stood out, not because of how fancy and opulent it was, but just because of how like casual and fun and comfortable it was. So we told people, like, bring your towels, bring your swim stuff, Ties will be confiscated at the car, <laughs> literally on the uh, on the invitation. And yeah, we just kind of needed like a barbecue buffet kind of deal and just had a good time. Um, it, it's kind of funny because, because it was the end of July, it was July 27th, 2003. Um, it was... You know, it was like 104 degrees outside. And so I think we had the ceremony at maybe 11 in the morning. So by the time we were all done with everything, it was, you know, four o'clock or something. And we, for our honeymoon, we, were, we did a California road trip where we we're going to drive down to San Diego first and then kind of make our way back up the coast. So we, would, we weren't going to leave till the next morning. So we spent our wedding night at Lake Natoma Inn, which is right on the American River, Lake Natoma. And, um, right, just right there in town <laughs> and we get to the room and unpack. We like counted our loot 
uh, because basically because he was about to join the Marine Corps, we'd put on the invitation as well, like doodle, like we don't have anywhere to put stuff. So a money tree will be available, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> no, to no toasters, please, just cold hard cash. So we counted our, counted up our money, put it in the safe, and then we're like, yeah, I'm hungry. And uh, we ended up at Chevy's <laughs> for, uh, on our wedding night. Um, <laughs> our wedding afternoon, it was probably like four or five o'clock. Um, and then this guy from high school ended up being our server, which is kind of funny. Oh, that's kind of fun. Yeah. He's like, oh, hey, Carl. <laughs> he's like, oh, hey, guys, what are you up to? Sam's like, oh, yeah, we just got married. Like, oh, yeah, when? <laughs> oh, like four hours ago? <laughs> what are you doing at Chevy's? <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then now actually my co-working space is right there. It's in the same building as where Chevy's is. I look at the Lake Natoma Inn every day. Oh, you're still in this. That's neat. Yeah. That's kind of neat that, to have those connections that are still there. So so St Sam starts boot camp. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that yeah, that was... Not a great time for me. What happened? I, it was my, I didn't recognize it at the time, but it was definitely my first bout of depression. My best friend was gone for the first time. Um, obviously, it was very different than we were when, we were, when we were broken up, but it was rough. I spent the first night, I think I spent the night in my parents' house that night, but then otherwise I, I stayed with my in-laws and... I was actually the only kid at home for a while. My oldest brother-in-law had moved out a long time ago, and then my middle brother-in-law was uh, living in Long Beach at the time. And then he ended up moving back up maybe the last month before Sam graduated boot camp. But, yeah, I was the only kid at home with my in-laws for a couple of months. And I was just kind of existing. I was working at Carmack still, and glad I had kind of a, a good, you know, community there. I was working in the business office, but I had previously, I had initially started in sales. So I had my business office people, but then I was friends with all the sales people and, um, which were mostly guys and they all like really looked out for me and made sure I was doing okay. And, but when I wasn't at work, it was just a real bummer. You know, and I would, on days that I didn't work or whatever, I would just lie around in my pajamas. And I remember the thing that I ate most often, this is really sad, especially knowing what I know now about nutrition, was instant mashed potatoes and canned corn. Oh, dear. Yeah. There was probably some chicken in there every now and then. <laughs> but <laughs> Aaron, did you... Did you recognize it as depression at the time? Not at all. I was in denial about any mental health issues until maybe four or five years ago. Okay, so that would have been almost more than 10 years. Yeah. So you had for 10 years that you battled with stuff. Yeah. Which people do. Yeah. But without recognizing what it was. Well, and it was really denial, too, because there's a significant family history. And so I didn't want that to be a thing. Is the history of depression? My mom um, has had major clinical depression for 20-ish years. Her sister has significant mental health issues. And their mom was both bipolar and paranoid schizophrenic. So that was the main thing that like really scared me um, was my grandma. She, oh, she died right before I turned four. And I have two really specific memories. One was really pleasant and nice. I can picture the center island in their kitchen and it was, uh, it was either like an avocado green or an orange, like 70s. Yes. And... Um, in there were like drawers in the island, and in one of the lower drawers, she kept the pinwheel cookies. Oh, yeah. And so I remember I knew that, and I was like going with her to go get the cookies. So that's the positive memory. And then one time, they were uh, my Nana and Papa were watching me while my parents went to dinner or something, and 
I was sitting on the floor playing with Duplos or some, some sort of blocks. And I don't remember what she said, but she like snapped at me about something. And I just remember being like really confused. But my grandpa was there and like fixed the situation, whatever it was. But I just remember being like kind of like scared and confused. And I was like three. Um, but, you know, I grew up hearing literally horror stories from my mom and my aunt about what they went through in their childhood. And so that has always been on my mind. And she got married, um, she and my grandpa married when she was 14 and then had her kids at 15, 16, and 17. Oh my. And now I know that if you are going to uh, have paranoid schizophrenia, you often get it, it, it manifests in your late teens or 20s. So that's, it was just, if you're going to have it, that's when you're going to get it. But in my mind, as growing up, I was thinking her hormones changed because she had babies. Sure. And that's what, that's how she got it. So I was always even afraid just to like get pregnant because I thought that was going to essentially give me paranoid schizophrenia. Those are really scary thoughts that you had to have for a Mm -hmm. really long time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what I'd like to do is, can we continue talking in this vein? And maybe yeah. also talk a little bit about uh, where your spirituality was during these years um, in the next episode. Absolutely. Thank you, Erin. <laughs>